This morning we continue our study back in the book of Romans, chapter 12. If you've got your Bibles, if you'll join me there. We've taken a couple of weeks break from that, but now we want to get back into that. But when we come to the passage where we are now in verse 9, Paul has kind of really changed the way that he's been teaching, the way that he's been talking to people. You see, earlier he's kind of talking in long sentences, and he's given a lot of information that you can unpack a little bit, that he's given just kind of a sentence to think about. But when he becomes to, to the point in verse, chap, in verse 12 of, of verse 9 of Romans chapter 12, he really begins to put a lot of things together. In, in fact, he begins to put a lot of things on top of one another, and really beginning in verse 9, he just goes, uh, just like lickety split, if you will. He begins to say verse after verse after verse and thing after thing, and I've really been kind of struggling to try to figure out how do I communicate that passage. And so what I want to do today is we're going to kind of read through some of that, and then we'll kind of come back and unpack some of that later. So Romans chapter 12, verse 9, I am calling these things sweet obligations. Now, I call them sweet obligations because when you look at this passage, these are things that as believers we are supposed to do. All right? These are things that you and I are supposed to do, but these are things that we do because we want to. There are benefits to these things. Uh, these are things that we want to do, things that are beneficial to us. In fact, like tomorrow, guys, we have an obligation as men in America to buy our wives flowers and chocolate. I think I've got a picture of that in my slides, but they're not. There they are. Uh, that we have this opportunity to buy flowers and chocolates for our wives. Now, we want to do this, right, men? We want to do this, and many of us do this on a weekly basis, but tomorrow, but tomorrow we have an obligation to do this, men, right? You know, and so we've got to do that. Just a reminder that men, tomorrow is what? Valentine's Day. So we've got that obligation. Now, and we're going to do it, not just because everybody else is doing it, and not because we'll be in trouble if we don't, but we're going to do this because we love our wives. Amen? Amen. Okay, good job, guys. Way to go on that one. And these things we're supposed to be doing that we're going to read about over the next couple of weeks, these are obligations. These are things we're supposed to do. But these ought to be things that we want to do. They ought to be a sweet obligation to them. So what I want to do today is read through the passage, and then we'll come back and look at just the first part of this. Here's what Paul writes. He says, Love must be sincere. Hate what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Honor one another above yourselves. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. And there's a mouthful right here, verse 12. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Ooh, there's some things there. Share with God's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Oh, anybody struggle with that one? Boy, y yesterday, my son got a cheap shot on him in basketball, and we're playing right here in our gym, and I forgot who I was, and I forgot where I was. Um... And I did not bless uh, and per and instead of persecute those. I was upset about that. But they got the call right, and fortunately that ref doesn't go to our church. So we're okay. <clears throat> but it is difficult to bless those who persecute you, isn't it? It's tough. It's tough to do. Bless and do not curse. I was close on that one. Verse 15, rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. Hmm. Boy, I was doing good to there, huh? Do not repay anyone evil for evil, but be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everybody. And I love this verse, my favorite verse. If it is possible, as far as it depends upon you, a couple of weasel words there for us, right? Live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my friends, but leave room for God's wrath, for it is written, it is mine to avenge. I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, you feed him. If your enemy is thirsty, you, you give him something to drink. And there's some benefit to this, because in doing so, you will heat burning coals on his head. <laughs> some benefit to that. But even then, that's not our natural inclination. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. We've got a lot of fun we're going to have over the next couple of weeks, because those are life-changing, sweet obligations that are going to radicalize who we are as people. But we want to concentrate first on this concept of love must be sincere. When we come to this passage in verse 9, different Bible translations translate this in different ways. The NIV says love must be sincere. If you pick up another translation, such as the ESV, which is the version that I'm beginning to lean to, it says let love be genuine. 
Now that kind of opens that understanding up, doesn't it? Love sincere. Love can be sincere. Then love should be genuine. And then the NAS, New American Standard, and the Holman Christian Standard Bible, which I call the Hardcore Southern Baptist Bible because we own that translation. But <laughs> it says, let love be without hypocrisy. Now I know that some of you are King James Version loving people. And the King James makes this completely clear because it says, let love be without dissimulation. Very clear, right? You understand that. Well, what they're trying to do is they're trying to translate this particular phrase in the Greek. You may or may not know, but when, the, when they originally wrote the Greek New Testament, the original, especially the original writings, most of the time they would write that in what's called unical, which means that they are writing it in capital letters. And oftentimes, they wouldn't even leave any spaces or any punctuation. So it's just capital letter after capital letter. It's very difficult sometimes to even translate. I prefer to look at it this way. And though I have practiced the translation of this to impress you with my Greek abilities, I am not going to do that. But here's what it really means when you break those three words down. It really means the love unfeigned. Now, how many of you, if I were to ask you to come up on stage today, could define unfeigned, could do that for me? I mean, if you could do that, okay? We've got a couple of English teachers in the room. That's very good. Glad that you're here today with us. But when I begin to think, what does it mean to have unfeigned love? This is what I thought of. This is exactly the picture that I thought of. Now, I don't know if you had the opportunity that I did, but when the World Cup was going on this past summer, I would happen to be on vacation. And so I had a tough vacation. I was staying at a condo on the beach. It was really tough. And so what I would do is I would leave the condo, and I'd go sit on the beach, and I would turn red after about 15 minutes because I'm very Caucasian. And so then I would come back in, and then I would watch World Cup soccer, the beautiful game. And it doesn't matter what's going to happen after this. You, you don't know what the is going to happen in this play from the picture, but I can tell you what's going to happen. Both of them are probably going to be writhing on the field in pain. Okay? Do you remember watching the World Cup, the beautiful game? It didn't matter if anybody was close or not close. As soon as people come near one another, everybody falls down on the ground and pretends like they're going to die, that their leg has just been broken and somebody's going to, have to drag their body off of the field, and they're waiting for that referee to pull out the yellow card, and the same thing happens. If he pulls out the yellow card, or if he doesn't pull out the yellow card, the same thing happens. In about 15 seconds, that person who could not walk gets miraculously healed, and he gets right back in the game, and he does it all the rest of the day. Right? That's what it means to feign something. It means to pretend. It means to, to fake it. It means not to be real. It means to, to camouflage the truth. All, all those things are tied in to that passage. And let me tell you that tomorrow is one of the biggest days that you and I are taught to pretend to love. <laughs> Isn't it right? I mean, our culture is building into us that tomorrow is the day that we pretend like we love people. In fact, we make children give a valentine to everyone in the class. <laughs> don't we? And you know why we do that? We do that so people like me will get a valentine. That is the reason that we do that, because I wouldn't get one in any other situation. And let me just say just a quick little statement here to my, my friends that are single, just for a moment. Listen, I, I know that the world tells you that you're not complete unless you're married. Can I tell you? That's not true. That's not true. You are complete in and of yourself. And do not give up, give in, or settle just so that you have some kind of valentine with you tomorrow. Don't do it. If God has given you a solo, sing out loud. You hear me? Jesus was questioned about marriage in heaven, and he said, what's it going to be like? And Jesus says, well, people are not going to be in married in heaven. That's good news for some of y'all. <laughs> Gives you something to hold on to that one day, <laughs> one day you're going to get rid of him, right? To some of us who happen to like our spouse, that's a little scary concept, isn't it? But you know what? We come in this world individually, and we leave individually, and our relationship and our value to God is not built on another relationship with a human being. It's built upon a relationship with Him. Okay? So if you're single, it's okay. You're not half a person. I know that we have dinner for two for everywhere. I understand that. But you are strong, you are good, and it's okay. And for whatever reason or season God has you for that, embrace who God has created you to be in the situation that you are and live out for his glory and honor. Okay? Now back to the regularly scheduled message, all right? <laughs> Love must be sincere. 
Now, sometimes it's difficult to understand what it means to be sincere or to genuine. What does real love mean? And so I thought it's easier not to understand what real love is, but what real love is not. How many of you have ever been loved with insincere love? How many of you have ever been pretended love? How many somebody has faked you out because you really thought they cared about you, but they didn't care about you. They cared about what they could get out of you. Listen to me, girls. Boys will say all kinds of things. Can I tell you this? And girls, listen to me. Boys are overrated. <laughs> I'm not going to tell you what husbands are. <laughs> boys are overrated. And boys will tell you all kinds of things to get something from you. And you say, if you really love me, you wouldn't even act or talk or think like that. Have you ever had that kind of love experience where, where you thought that person really cared about you, but they really didn't care about you? They didn't want you. They wanted something from you. If you try this experiment for fun. Someday at the end of the month, go rent an expensive car. Okay? Go rent an expensive car, wear your best clothes, and go to a car dealership. Okay? End of the month, they've got to make their sales. You look like you have money. Okay? And you pull up in a nice car and see what kind of love you get when you pull up in the parking lot. Or have you ever done business with somebody and they promised you excellent customer service? We stand beside our customer. We'll be with them forever. Have you ever done that? And what happens? You, they don't return your calls. When, you're trying to make a, when they're making a sale, they'll return your calls. We have to live this way. I'm not knocking car salesmen. I love car salesmen. I love everybody. Uh, here's the deal. <laughs> we know what it feels like to be loved with an insincere love, an ingenuine, disgenuine, dissimulation type love. We know what that feels like. And our calling is not to treat people like that because it's wrong to do that. Now, I'm not saying that I want my car dealer to be my best buddy and call me every week and ask me how it's going. I'm not saying that either. But what I'm saying is that you and I are supposed to demonstrate not some insincere fake love, but a genuine, unfeigned love. One, because it's the right thing to do. But number two, because we've experienced that from God himself. Because you see, here's what God did for us. He sent his own son to live a perfect life and die for us, and you can completely reject him, and he says, that's okay. He doesn't force you. He doesn't make you. The Bible says that he causes it to rain on both the just and who else? The unjust. But once we've experienced that, and we know what it's like to have real, genuine love, then we have an obligation, it is a sweet obligation, but an obligation nonetheless to demonstrate that love to other people. The people that we do business with. The people that are in, within our household. Even the referee, believe it or not, we are called to have genuine love for the individual that is there. How much so? So much so that Jesus... The Bible talks about Jesus saying that greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay, what, down his life for his friends. And you really, it's really kind of hard to get benefit after you lay your life down for someone else. Do you know that? that? You don't get a lot of benefit of doing that. And yet that is what God did for us. And so what you and I have to do, what we're supposed to do, is we are supposed to do that for other people. And I will tell you, this is one of the most powerful tools that we have in our arsenal today. Two weeks ago, I'm passing out gum in San Francisco. Okay. And so I'm standing there, and I've got a partner with me who was our group, and I'm standing there going, uh, free gum, free gum. Anybody want some free gum? I've got free gum. Anybody want free gum? So I, I don't want to talk to anybody. I don't like people in the first place. I don't want any strange person coming to me to get gum. So I'm just like, you know, free gum, free gum. And amazingly, people didn't come to me for some reason. I don't know why that was. And I don't get to go home until I get rid of all this gum in my back. Okay? So I have to change strategies. I have to go, free gum! Gum that's free! Free! Emphasis on free. In fact, I started saying, hey, gum, no strings attached. Just take the gum so that I can go home. That's all I'm asking for. And what's amazing is in San Francisco, people are passing out stuff all the time. Uh, there are a thousand homeless people asking you for something. And so when you're asking for something, you're saying something, people don't want that. But when I said free, that magic word... This happened all the time. People were walking along, and they're going this way, free gum, and they're like, free? You got, you got free gum? You know, my breath's kind of bad, and they're just kind of like, 
Thank you for the free gum. Why? Because nothing's free. Because you're out to get me. You're out to get something from me. You're not trying to give me gum. You're, you're trying to get something from me. And so I don't really trust you. But when we go out into the world and we say, you know, we're going to love you, not to get something out of you, but simply because God asked us to do that, it has a powerful way of changing people's attitudes. So here's the, here's the quick little thing today. And by the way, the PowerPoint messed up. It was cute cursive writing there on the cake, so excuse me for not getting the cursive writing. Computers didn't talk right to each other. But you're under an obligation to have genuine love for people. And if you're like me, you can't manufacture that. You can't make it up. So what you have to do is you have to ask God to help you do that. And if you do that in our society, in our world today, it changes the hearts of people. Now, you may not be able to do this because you've never experienced it. But God invites you to come to him. And even though you've been loved with an insincere love, where somebody pretended they loved you and they really didn't love you, and you've been burned on that, maybe it was your family growing up, maybe it's a relationship that you're in now, can I promise you that God wants nothing other than the best for you? And he, he promised that and, and demonstrated that by sending his own son to die for you, whether or not you want him to do that or not. He does, that's your choice. But he's done that for you. And you can experience that today if you come to the point in your life you say, you know what, I don't even know which way is up. But I want to follow you. He can do that. And then for you and I, we need to have that obligation to other people. I've got to do better at that. I'm working on it. Because we have an obligation to demonstrate sincere love for other people for the benefit of themselves, but also for the greater glory of the kingdom. So here's the message. Here's the application. Here it is. You have an obligation to love sincerely. Would you bow your heads, close your eyes.